Okay, good morning to all of you, and a special thanks, of course, to Hans and Gulsen for their uh, incredible hospitality, not only this year, but all the previous years, and maybe some years in the future. Uh, my subject, the trouble with society, uh, I will deal with it from the point of view of uh, the philosophy of law and politics, and that is, of course, uh, wide terrain, just how wide uh, the n number of topics one could uh, cover under this uh, approach. First of all, a few words about the philosophy of law, then the general uh, approach uh, to the philosophy of law in the particular context in which we are interested in it, the law of the world, of societies and communities and so on in the world, and then all the other uh, concepts that come into play. <coughs> Sorry. Philosophy of law is really a philosophy, uh, all of philosophy, because law, the basic sense of the word is order. And what philosophers do is look for order uh, in the different areas where we participate. First of all, the order of ideas, the totality of all logical things, and uh, in particular, pure quantities, numbers, mathematics, and pure qualities. Uh, pure qualities in German and Dutch Pure translates as schön or schoon, and schoonheid, schoonheid uh, translates into English as uh, beauty or beautifulness. So it is uh, in this area of ideas that we find the uh, philosophy of beauty uh, understood as understanding the things in their pureness. And eventually, I will talk here about society itself, that is, society in its pureness, or relative pureness, uh, without all the distracting connotations it may have, pleasant or unpleasant. Second area for the philosophy of law is order of or in nature, and nature consensibly understood as all those things that exist, whether or not there are human persons. But of course, uh, they are observable, observable and measurable uh, by humans. And third, law or order of or in the world, uh, then we are speaking about all the things that exist only because there are uh, human persons. In this context, the expression natural law means the order of natural persons. Natural persons, humans, of course. And the grand scheme, the cosmos, the totality of things, uh, but we will not discuss that here. And the discussion of law laws of nature, laws of man, uh, always needs to make at some point a distinction between lawfulness and uh, legality. That is because the origin of the word legality uh, is the Latin lex, and that really means a command, right? And uh, law, understood as a law is merely a principle of order. And that need not be, and usually is not, a command. Right? Uh, laws can be discovered. Commands are not discovered. They are given, imposed. Uh, valid law defines a paradigm of order. And there are some examples here. Axiomatic laws, uh, mathematical, <coughs> mathematical laws, uh, but also in ethics, uh, nothing is better than goodness, goodness itself. That is, nothing is better than pure goodness. Nothing is worse than pure 
evil, but also, and for the scientists here, more relevant postulated laws, uh, which define a paradigmatic conception of order, uh, which, unlike an axiomatic law, is, cannot, uh, uh, can be uh, gainsaid, can be contradicted, but uh, not with reasoning or with experiments within the same paradigm. It's like, uh, it defines a kind of language to speak about things. An example is Euclid's uh, postulate of parallel lines versus the much later uh, postulates of uh, cursed space. Aristotle's law of motion versus the uh, laws of inertia that launched modern science in the uh, 16th and in the 17th century, and finally, uh, the postulate of praxeology, man acts purposively, uh, versus, for example, the postulate of uh, behaviorism. Now, usually, the uh, postulate of praxeology is called the axiom of praxeology, but that is because it uh, does not uh, look at the pure format of the statement, because man acts not, does not act purposely or for a purpose, is not a contradiction, a form of contradiction. Right? So it can be posited, uh, but it is, cannot be uh, defended, as Mises said, uh, because every attempt to uh, defend a rejection of man acts for purpose uh, exemplifies, every attempt to refute exemplifies the truth of the action. So, but purely logically speaking, it is a postulate, it's not, not an irrefutable action. And then you have the uh, empirical laws, uh, but we are not going to discuss that. And then the other idea that uh, law comes from uh, command, and then you have the lex legal uh, family of concepts, uh, where lex is imposed by public authority, also by contract, so an arbitrary agreement uh, is a, a legal uh, imposition. And uh, we talk about legal rights and legal obligations, uh, and these are imposed on elected or selected or collected persons. So there's always this idea of lex, uh, choice. This is an old distinction between law and legality. Uh, if you go back to the digesta, of uh, Ulpian in the uh, Corpus Juris Civilis of the Emperor Justinianus, who was discussed uh, earlier, uh, you find the, the reason-based or use conception of law. Uh, justice is the constant and perpetual will to render to every man his due. And these, Ulpian continues, are the precepts of law to live honorably, to harm no one, to give to each his own. And finally, uh, the science of law is knowledge of divine and human affairs, the science of what is just and what is unjust. And as you can see, if you look at the Latin text, uh, the word lex does not appear, it's all about use. So this is a particular conception of law distinct from the following, also uh, from the Digesta uh, and from the same uh, author, Ulpian, the sovereign, the, the princeps, is not bound by any laws because what pleases the sovereign has the force of law. And uh, in both cases, law is a translation of the lex concept. So, so this is really another word and another 
reality, the command conception of uh, law. Now let's return for a moment to praxeology. The general uh, axiom or postulate uh, for uh, praxeology is man acts in pursuit of a goal a purpose, for a purpose and the most famous praxeology for the people here I guess is the uh, in pursuit of wealth right uh, economic praxeology is basically uh, the uh, purposeful, purposeful uh, pursuit of wealth as the goal there are two uh, there are uh, of course other goals you could have a praxeology of health uh, uh, man seeks health uh, that's certainly uh, modern man is a health seeker it's a, a serious business but also power fame holiness whatever you get whatever goal you see you can de develop it into a praxeology what to do to achieve this goal and in fact the face the, the first sorry the first famous uh, praxeology in the modern west uh, days from the 16th century uh, sorry uh, uh, was uh, written by uh, uh, Thomas Hobbes and is a praxeology of power right if you read the Leviathan it it starts with definitions concepts and it develops these there is no empirical study of anything whatsoever in fact Hobbes once famously uh, remarked, if uh, I had based my work on uh, experience, it would have been just as worthless as any other empirical work, any other work based on experience, because he did not really believe that people uh, learn much from uh, experience. But it was a very uh, systematic development of ideas. So uh, it certainly fits the model of praxeology. Now, I draw always two uh, uh, departments in praxeology. One is the managerial uh, praxeology. This is just the question, we have a goal, how to achieve it? Right? And then you devote all your attention and study to uh, solving the problem. What does a manager have to do uh, in order to achieve his goals effectively and then uh, efficiently. But the manager's perspective does not take account of the outside world, right? Is my as a manager you say, my responsibility is to make this thing work. This hotel, this firm, this company, this army battalion, uh, this is what I have to do. It's a very goal-oriented uh, perspective. General praxeology looks beyond, beyond the own household, which is to be managed, into the outside world and uh, asks which restrictions on uh, managerial decision-making uh, maximize uh, or oh, sorry minimize uh, negative external effects because external effects in that uh, are likely to create conflicts in the world and conflicts uh, can be all-consuming they can lead to war and war can uh, really mess things up uh, generally so avoiding conflicts with other households is not strictly related to the goal of a household, but it is related to the existence of households within uh, a wider world. And the question is, uh, minimize negative external effects without impeding positive external effects, right? So every gathering, even this gathering, there are some rules uh, to prevent negative external effects among the participants uh, without impeding positive exchange, discussions, and so on. Uh, praxeology of management, here you have the, the 
the saying, the end justifies the means, and this leads to the uh, managerial attitude. Uh, this is the goal. I have to uh, use the means available uh, to achieve it. And uh, it also leads to insights. If this is your goal, then you ought to do such and such. Praxeology of ethics asks, is a managerial uh, a department of managerial praxeology, but it does not start with what is your goal, but what ought to be your goal. So it, it has a, an explicitly normative uh, approach, and this translates into categorical laws, uh, because G ought to be your goal, you ought to do X. Uh, so this is uh, normative without uh, the ballast of hypothetical laws. Well, hy hypothetical laws say, if this is your goal, then you should do thi this. But if it's not your goal, okay, that's fine. So it's, it's not binding in any way. Okay. Uh, Remember the distinction between nature and the world, which I made uh, at the very beginning in order to distinguish areas of law. The distinction was made between nature is that which would exist even if there were no persons, no human persons, and the world comprises everything that exists because there are human persons. And the distinction, the classical distinction in philosophy uh, for, uh, that tells you what, when you have to deal with a person, if you are a person yourself, of course, is that you have to deal with a reason-able, a speech-able, uh, a logical uh, being, and the general term is a reason, uh, reason is the characteristic of personhood, and it, it comprises the, uh, what is essentially the ability to master symbols, to think, read and reckon, to ask and answer questions, to give, understand and evaluate semantically and pragmatically meaningful descriptions uh, and exp uh, explanations and reasons as relevant answers to a question. Now, symbols are something you do not find in nature, right? It's typically something of the world. And symbols, although they may be represented by physical shapes, they are never the physical shape itself. This came up in the discussion uh, yesterday, I think. Neither the symbolic value, the meaning, nor the pragmatic value, importance of a physical thing can be derived from its shape or any other of its physical properties. That means that you will never get to the world if you uh, think only in terms of physical forces and uh, reactions. And the uh, most important point, really, the third point under the heading reason, uh, a material shape becomes a symbol, meaningful symbol only in a linguistic context, context with other symbols. Uh, that is a language with vocabulary and a grammar. But since symbol use is so essential to personhood, you can understand that this interdependence of symbols also means interdependence of uh, persons. You cannot become a person on your own, right? Because on your own, uh, you hardly need any symbols. Your symbol use uh, develops in, con uh, in the context of interactions, exchanges with other persons. And in Western uh, theology, uh, you have a residual effect of that in, in the notion of the God as Trinity. It's not one person, 
but it is a personal whole uh, made up of three persons. And it is only in the context of the other person that each person of the trinity takes on a meaning. A uh, second aspect, a more visible aspect of personhood, is the ability to present yourself, not always elegant, elegantly. This is a self-presentation, but I can imagine you have better examples of self-presentations than this one. Anyway, persons have the ability to speak for themselves and uh, also for other things, of course. And it is their ability to speak for other things that makes the world uh, so complex because people speak of animal rights, for example. Animals never speak of animal rights. It is something that happens in the world of persons. Buildings are set uh, uh, to have rights, uh, historical monuments and so on. That is because people are interested in them and they use their own language of rights <coughs> to speak for those, such things. Okay, uh, pure personhood, remember, that's what philosophy is all about, the purity of the concept, uh, is also called divine personhood, because God is the uh, pure example of uh, personhood, I'm not saying of a person, but personhood. Uh, in philosophy, because he is the quality of being perfectly reasonable, unaffected by natural forces. So there's no uh, influence of fire, water, uh, or any of the other, other elements, earth, soil, uh, atoms. These do not affect divine personhood, because it is pure personhood. It is nothing but personhood. And this is uh, related to, the, of course, the ability to reason and to present uh, itself. And this gives us the notion of a value. A value is a quality that is unquestionably better for a person to have than to lack. So, if you say, uh, Illness is a value, you are saying it's better to be ill than healthy. Few people say that, and those who say that say it only in the, context, in the context where they want to make a point that is not related to health, but say to logic, as I did just now. Seriously, nobody calls health a uh, sickness a value. It is not something that is better for a person. You can wish illnesses on another person, but that is not the same as calling it a value. Now, absolute values uh, is a value considered in its log logical purity. For example, uh, Schönheit itself, uh, the beauty itself. Uh, wisdom, another example of an absolute value. And here we consider it as something that cannot be taught better than the value itself. Wisdom, pure wisdom, uh, nothing can be better or wiser than pure wisdom itself. Because pure wisdom, conceptually, is nothing but wisdom. Right? Just as pure love is nothing but love. There are no uh, contaminations. This the reason why, for example, when, when we speak of pure evil, uh, we get into trouble because pure goodness, when it gets corrupted or contaminated, becomes worse. But if pure evil becomes corrupted or contaminated, it gets better. Right? So there is a, a, a conceptual, logical distinction between good things and evil, bad things. Uh, God, the, classi the classical definition in Western theology, specifically Western theology, 
uh, since the Middle Ages is uh, Anselm's notion of God, this idea of God as that better than which nothing can be thought. So it's the sum of all absolute values and the, the sum of all divine values. Uh, remember, uh, divum is a Latin noun and it means daylight, basically light. Uh, so the it's the, the God of light and the God of beauty uh, that is the, the center of uh, Western theology. Practical reason enters in it uh, thanks to the uh, explanations of uh, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, he uh, argued that the practical reason of the a creator, that is the uh, the stuff of which eternal law is, is made. Because it's the, the creator's wisdom that is the uh, uh, practical reason. And the uh, man, as participating in the eternal law, that is uh, also a definition of Thomas Aquinas, uh, man participates in the eternal law that makes him a co creator of the world. So it is the uh, primary function of uh, the human being uh, to be a co-creator of the world. But that means that he has to have practical wisdom, practical reason, right? and the development of that reason, call it the primacy of uh, practical reason, is recognized not only in the West, but also in other uh, civilizations. In China, for instance, uh, Lao Tzu and Confucius, uh, who uh, spoke about the way, the right way, right? The, the practical way, the right way to do things. Okay, natural personhood is uh, derived from divine personhood as a, a sort of contaminated, uh, impure version. Uh, and you have there the explanation that I just gave you, Thomas Aquinas, how he gets to the natural law via the participation in the eternal law, eternal law being the practical reason of the creator, right? It's the, the creator's uh, wisdom. And uh, practical reason seeks for natural persons to transcend human nature, which is humanness, uh, in search of humaneness. Uh, before, uh, just before I started talking here, uh, someone said, to me, uh, you're talking trouble with society, ah, the trouble with humanity. No, <laughs> it's a different thing. Society is a particular order in the world, but humanity as humaneness, the quality of your humaneness uh, is different from the quality of society. And one of the reasons why I talk about the problem or the trouble with society is that society is a word that is used all over the place without any specific meaning. Uh, remember Friedrich von Hayek uh, who called the adjective social a weasel word because it sucks the meaning out of every uh, noun uh, which it qualifies. And in fact society is also used as a, a kind of uh, distraction because it has a specific meaning, but it also has a very general meaning. It's everything is a society, a human society. And in the same way, when people talk about law, they very often mean just a collection of, of uh, legal orders or, or legal commands. So law becomes a system of commands. And when the, you use the word society loosely, uh, in many people get 
the impression that you are talking about in a loose way about this society and that society and another society. Not about the uh, general notion of human commerce and interaction. And it is in fact a uh, unfortunate uh, consequence of the fact that the medieval thinkers uh, who spoke Latin but lived in a world in which there were practically no societies. There were communities, there were villages, there were households, uh, there were occasional bands of armies and so on, but there were no societies in the Roman sense. But they used the word society, societas, the Roman word, uh, to uh, talk about the world they lived in, which was not a world marked by uh, social uh, orders. There were communal orders, there were tribes and so on, but not uh, uh, societies in the formal sense. Okay, uh, natural personhood contrasts, of course, with artificial persons. We are not going to discuss these in detail, uh, but we have a tendency uh, to personify everything, countries, firms, uh, groups, even objects, the art world, and that, that sort of thing. Uh, we personify them, making them look or sound as if they are persons. Now, going back, going to, uh, specifically to human law, this is uh, just a reminder that in the Western languages of law, all uh, thinking about law seems to be uh, governed by the logic of three Latin verbs. Regere, legere, and jurare. The first regere, from which the most famous noun is uh, derived, rex, uh, simply means to make straight, to control, uh, and it is an uh, an expression of force. The whole idea of positive law, modern positive law, is based on uh, somebody has the force to impose order. And that is the function of uh, the rex, the action of a rex. Second, legere, the, the lex group, uh, uh, has a different characteristic. I will go uh, into it uh, more in detail later. And the, la the last group, the jus group, uh, jurare, means to speak solemnly and relates uh, law uh, as a function of solemn speech, meaningful speech, uh, to the uh, jus conception of law, which I, I mentioned in connection with uh, uh, Ulpian's definition of uh, what the precepts of law are to live honestly and to, to harm no one and so on. Okay, regre, to keep it simple and graphical, is to govern by force or power and that means that the thing uh, governed, the, the box uh, below, uh, is not necessarily a, a person, it can be anything. But it is treated as a tool to be used for the uh, rex, uh, the, the master's uh, purpose. And the essential thing is tools have no rights. Simple. They are basically uh, to be used as needed and wanted by uh, their master. The, third, uh, the second notion, legere, uh, means to govern by institutionalized authority or the power, uh, the authority of an institutionalized uh, power. Now, authority simply means the, the quality of being an author, so a creator, if you want. Uh, but it depends, of course, uh, what is created and who creates uh, 
whether you will recognize it as an authority in the, in the common sense now. Right? To govern by authority of institutionalized power, uh, and it is, is, the word institutionalized indicates that we are dealing with an organizational context in which positions are recognized. So it's not just the person speaking giving a command, but it is the person speaking and giving a command from within a particular position in a, uh, an organization. Obviously, when Hans Hoppe uh, speaks here, he speaks as the institutionalized power, <laughs> the, the authority in uh, this context. His word is law here in the sense of lex. Uh, he cannot change the laws of nature or the laws of the world, but he can say, uh, change the laws of uh, these meetings, the leges, the commands that govern these meetings. Uh, the important implication and uh, an, an, an indication of what is wrong with society is that under this relation, rights and obligations attach to positions and not to natural persons. Because all of you who work for a large company, for example, uh, in large companies, as you know, people will say, I will, I want a promotion because then I will get in a position where I can do such and such and such, which I cannot do now. And I will earn more or uh, have more perks of office. Your rights and obligations change with the position. You need not change, but your position changes, and that makes all the difference. Then, Urare, on the other hand, uh, requires natural persons. Positions in an organization do not speak neither solemnly nor in jokes. Uh, they, do not sim they do not speak simply. It's only natural persons that have this power, uh, this faculty of uh, solemn speech. And uh, from this ability, if used interchangeably, arise argumentation and uh, negotiation. So the use-based conception of law is really the conception of law among speakers or potential speakers. But the, to speak, that is the order of law. That makes argumentation ethics uh, such a vital element in the whole uh, construction of thinking about man and the world. Because man is a speaker and all the discussions about the world are among speakers. If there are other conflicts about the world, it's usually war, right? And, 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 and uh, treachery and, and uh, other uh, fraudulent actions. But now, the use relationship between speakers as you can see in red there, is traditionally called free and equal, uh, the free and equal condition of law. I remember my first lecture when I uh, went to law school, an assistant professor uh, came to give the introduction and uh, she told us that law is the order imposed by the state on society. That was her definition. It took until the third year before an elderly professor said, well, actually, uh, law is a relationship of freedom between equals. That is where you have to get your idea of order from. It's something you have to work out in your mind. It's not something that you find in the command book uh, by the, offered by the state. Important point, urare exists only between natural persons. So you have a co direct connection with the, the idea of natural law, the order of natural persons, and this uh, use conception of law, the speech relation between speakers. 
Okay, the final move. Unfortunately, the world is full of conflicts, and these conflicts called interpersonal conflicts. I leave aside intrapersonal conflicts. Uh, these always involve a plurality of persons who have free access to the same scarce resources which they want to use for uh, diverse uh, purposes on the basis of diverse opinions uh, for diverse goals. So this conflict, uh, these conflict situations are everywhere. Most of the time they remain latent or potential conflicts, but very often they flare up. Somebody said this, uh, the wrong word or made the, the, the wrong uh, movement and the movement became a racket, as we heard yesterday. Uh, good. How to solve interpersonal conflicts? One possibility, you eliminate scarcity. If you eliminate scarcity, then there is no more interpersonal conflict. But it has to be total and absolute abundance total and absolute elimination of scarcity. Because as long as any scarcity remains, people will have the impulse to say, I am going to use this for my purpose. But I'm not uh, going, if you study Marxism or uh, other uh, avenues to utopia, uh, you should study the condition of abundance, but it is not uh, something we experience abundance. Right? So I'm going to skip this. The second solution to the problem of interpersonal uh, conflict is what I call conviviality. Remember, conviviality is a condition, a quality, like community is equality, like society is equality. Right? And the, I use the word conviviality uh, where Hayek had used the word catalactic, but that has too much of a medical connotation, I think. It never caught on the cat catalactic order uh, sounds like science fiction or something. Conviviality is a familiar word, word and it uh, derives from the medieval Latin word convivere, to live together. And uh, this is different from the classical uh, word convivi, which uh, is a, a verb uh, meaning uh, to have a festive meal together or something. But conviviality is a general term and uh, why do I choose it? Because it has this notion of people, natural law, but also because the typical convivial relationship is among persons and their uh, personal property intact. There are two contexts in which uh, conviviality is uh, familiar. When you are among friends, you would not think among friends that one of them is going to steal you or, or, or to uh, make fraudulent uh, suggestions to you. And the, at the other end, the wider world. We are, I am, Belgian national living in Turkey. I go out in the street. I have absolutely no problem with the local population and they do not have any problem with me. So there is a, a basis of mutual respect and uh, of course there may be misunderstandings but they are solved in the spirit of conviviality. This is uh, to me uh, the great discovery of the Middle Ages, 
that they transcended the communal orders, the tribal orders, and built up this idea over the boundaries of tribes, people can live in uh, a friendship, peace, and, and enjoy life as such. Community is probably the, the most essential in the sense of the most uh, basic form of solution to uh, the problem of interpersonal scarcity. It does not eliminate personal uh, property, but it recognizes that these personal holdings, property holdings, are never all inclusive. Right? You all always have commons, the streets, the beaches, uh, and people like that. They, they like not to be uh, stopped, show your papers, show your ticket, and so on. But community is a way of solving the coexistence of personal property and uh, communal property by requiring a sort of a common approach, common uh, consensus on basic values and basic uh, opinions for dealing with the common parts of the world. And these things may, of course, turn into uh, claustrophobic uh, experiences when different communities exist close to one another, each with their own ideas of how to deal with the, the commons of uh, human interaction. Society, the last one, and the troubles, troublemaker, because it is a solution for interpersonal conflict that res, uh, relies on the elimination of plurality of persons and plurality or diversity of opinions, because in society, the societal decision makers are the judges of what can be thought and what can not be uh, thought or said or done or whatever. And all the other members of society are pushed into subordinate positions, more or less, in fact, more <laughs> rather than less in the shape of tools. Now, there's all sorts of uh, connotations of society, open societies, democratic societies, where the connotations hide the fact that ultimately you are to obey what is being uh, commanded to you. I remember the famous essay by Immanuel Kant on uh, what is the Enlightenment, uh, it begins with dare to uh, think and it ends with you can criticize all you want but obey. Right? That was the, the conclusion of this. Free speech, okay, but not if we uh, from the top say what to do. Uh, society, here the summary, is a vertical structure with an increasing scarcity of higher positions. So th this gives the notion of this, the social elite at the top of the pyramid. Uh, it has little, it has no internal markets, societies, right? because they are structured as command entities. You can have markets between societies, but not within society. So the more society comes to dominate, the more it, uh, the more it uh, achieves the position of the top order in the world, as it is doing today, uh, the more uh, uh, these societal effects elimination of markets, elimination of free speech, of, of uh, uh, reasonable speech, uh, 
is eliminated. The primitive world had only communities, but very little uh, transactions between different communities. But conviviality within communities was essential because otherwise there would be no possibility to raise children, for example. In the Middle Ages, the grand uh, transcendence was achieved where order was thought of in terms of a civilization which was basically the same civilization but had very different local uh, communities, language communities, even uh, different linguistic, uh, different religious communities, with varieties of, of religions. And in, but in modern times, with the rise of the state, uh, you had this drive towards socialization. Socialized man, uh, even in Mises, <laughs> of all places, you find, a, a, as it were, the society and socialization are, are discussed as positive terms, the socialized man, socialization, giving man a position, the human being, a position in society. That is, of course, because he uses the word society there in the loose sense, where it has no structural uh, properties other than market. But a market is not a society. Right? And the, the people uh, in uh, who push for socialization, they are now uh, pushing for, uh, what is it, the transhumanist agenda. You have to change human beings so that they can be better fitted into our societal project. Right? That is the thing. So, to sum up, societies in themselves considered as top orders are lawless, command-based orders. They're lex-based, eh? not uh, use-based. They are committed to force as the religious factor. I use the word religious as synonym for binding, right? And you have different type of uh, religious. Basically, in the West, the religion of reason and the religion of force. And the, the religion of reason that uses reason in the sense in which I had it under the discussion of personhood. So the logos speech uh, as the, the, the religious factor in the human world. And society is uh, always intent on creating a qualitative difference between the governing elite and the uh, subordinate population. Otherwise, if you do not do that, the effectiveness of a command-based order uh, simply disappears. In order to have, this is the, the noble lie about which Plato spoke. People have to believe that they are commanded by sup superior beings, otherwise they will not uh, obey. And that's it. Uh, I have overstepped my time limit. My apologies. Thank you.